Welcome to yet another installment of Writer's Talking. This, in fact, is the first real sort of formal, uh, you know, start of the Writer's Talking for this year, 2015. And I hope the sheep is going to be blessing us more uh, as the Chinese New Year season also comes in. What we're going to do is um, either tomorrow or the day after, we're going to send you a list of speakers all through until April. So uh, you know that for the next three months, February, March, and April, who the writers are going to be and who's going to be occupying these seats. The idea is very simple. The idea is trying to get a mix of writers, young and old, male, female, uh, fiction, non-fiction, to come and share with us um, their views, as well as do some short readings from uh, what they have done. So we're very happy tonight to have with us uh, Anita Bennett, as well as Felix Chong, to uh, writers from here. One, uh, I, if I may say a little bit, Anita, I hope you don't mind, a little bit better known than Anita, but because he's got uh, several books, uh, that's Felix. Anita is fairly new in the world of publishing and writing, but nevertheless, uh, we are very, very delighted to do this. This is something that I want to encourage, because quite often in a place like Singapore, it's very hard for the new writers to make uh, any kind of impact in a direct, significant kind of way. I'm also increasingly disappointed that uh, our main uh, newspaper, Straits Times, uh, has seen it fit not to give the Singapore literary scene uh, much more robust of a coverage. And I miss the days when there were real reviews. I mean, now sometimes the reviews are more decorations um, you know, than anything else. So, and this, I think, extends to even the world of theater and drama. And we do miss the uh, old, very, very uh, cutting, sometimes uh, very bitingly so, but incisive reviews of our work so that our writers could know how intelligent readers were at least responding to what they were publishing. I, I have just flown in from Manila this, uh, this afternoon, and the um, story there was a person actually talking to us quite uh, energetically about the fact that a birth in some ways also clouded everything. And this was last night in Manila. This afternoon, the High Commissioner from South Africa said the same thing. So it struck me that two women in two different parts of, in a way, the world, uh, both had this cloud, as it were, this memory. Memory might be a better word. But cloud is also, uh, I think, pointed um, in connection with how they felt that their sensibilities were very much uh, fashioned and shaped by their birth. So on that note, um, as I said, we're going to invite both of them to say a few words about their writing, read a few uh, poems in this case, and both are uh, better known as poets than, uh, than fiction writers, though I must say my good friend Felix has ventured into this wonderful world of fiction as well. Um, they both have very good uh, sort of biographies to recommend this is on the e files that we sent you. So without further ado, can I call upon you, Felix, first, to begin? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kapal, for inviting me. Uh, I was supposed to be here in October, but unfortunately I was delayed by a flight uh, from Manila. So here I am, better late than never. Well, a little bit of background about myself. Um, I published four books of poetry, uh, two young adult novels, one book of uh, non-fiction interviews, and uh, one collection of short stories, and two collections recently published of uh, flash fiction. Now, flash fiction are short, short uh, stories, sometimes maybe about 800 words long, and they are called Singapore Siutai. Singapore Siutai 1 and Singapore Siutai 2. So read them if you like, uh, because they're satirical, they kind of book gentle fun that different aspects of life in Singapore, from our politics to our kiasu behavior to you know, any aspect of Singapore life. But for today, I will just be reading from my poetry. And I'm reading a different range, uh, different genres, from love poems to dramatic monologues. Now, Kapa asked me to say a little bit uh, about my writing background first. So here it is. I started writing seriously when I was I think, in JC 1 or 2 and as with most poets I wrote a little poem in order to impress a girl. <laughs> I wrote this long uh, 
uh, almost embarrassingly so, uh, it, everything rhymes, and I was using a very archaic, old-fashioned Shakespearean kind of language. Of course, the girl wasn't impressed. <laughs> so there was a blank wall, I just ran straight into it. But that gave me the impetus to, to write, to play with words, and often treated language like oh, playing with Lego blocks. And, you know, we can take them apart, put them together in different ways. And that's one of the defining features of my poetry. I like to pun. I like to play with words, play with puns a lot. And in part, I think, um, when I was younger, I like to listen to Xiangsheng, cross talk in Mandarin, and they pun hell of a lot. And even my creative writing supervisor in Australia, I did my master's in creative writing at uh, the University of Brisbane, he told me this once, Felix, you're an incorrigible punster. So then, so as you listen to some of my poems, you'll notice the play we worked. And the first, uh, since next month is Valentine's Day, I will start with a few poems, no poems. So dedicated to all the women out there. <laughs> this is called One Day. One day, you will arrive here. No matter the flowers and years, this plain where nothing happens, as slowly as nothing can happen. One day, you will realize poetry is no longer enough. That despite rarely cries against fate, things are still turned on their heads. One day, your heart too will struggle to remember the reasons for choices it once considered the center of the universe. One day, this cross book will be yours for keeps, and neither a limp nor a leap makes any difference to the land. One day, you will understand why I drank the darkness, kick the compass, love you in such madness. Thank you. Uh, I'll just read you a few points that I memorized. Uh, I've done traveled quite a bit in terms of um, attending festivals, or writers' festivals. So as part of the training towards um, those festivals, I've memorized a few poems. And it often creates better rapport with the audience if I can look them straight in the eye about it. So the next one is called Missing You. Another little poem. I miss you, dawn, dream, and dusk. Whenever my words run up and crawl, toothless and silent at last, to the candle of the heart. I miss you in the privacy of pain, a cry tucked beneath sheets, a kiss unfinished over distances. And I shall miss you when I'm neither here nor there, neither a ghost nor a shadow, more than love can endure, more than time will allow. See another poem. I'm, I'm going to read until you get sick of me. <laughs> this one is called Love is a Stranger. Love is a strand, a leap, a leash, a way out, a tunnel in. It is a stranger, a strand. Straight. Cigarette left mid breath on an ashtray. It is believing when the knock comes. You will answer it with ease. Thank you. For the next one, I will need a bit of cooperation from you guys. So when I point to you, can you say this word with me? Edit. E D I T. Now, the reason why is because this poem is titled A Love Poem 
by the way of Wikipedia. And you know Wikipedia has this edit where you can go in, change things around. So what I did was I wrote this poem using and compressing all the cliches about love. And then in the next stanza, I kind of played the words. And this is where my pani comes in. And you'll notice that the same words are used in a different context, in a different way. So here it goes. A love poem by way of Wikipedia. It is a many standard thing, a crazy little thing. The old devil, blind, star claws, head over heels, patient and kind, never having to say your sorry. It is an old crazy patient, sorry splendor, blind as heels, the devil's kind of cross. Never stars or say in your head. Little by little, it is a thing and over. Thank you. Now, uh, I've also written a series of poems in which I've argued with God. And of course, we know who wins the debate. Um, well, being a Catholic, born Catholic, I had no choice. So the only way I could get out of it was to argue furiously with him. And of course, he always wins. This is titled Shadow Boxing. Master, why do you leave me out cold no matter the words I conjure and throw with the lurches of a boxer on the last licks of his round? Don't you care as my riddle now, my fisted poems, punchy air, that I might collapse in a heap? Or is that your strategy? Allow me space to run rings about my rage. The exhaustion or the deafening bell sends me sprawling to the ground. Well, I love to get <laughs> Next one, uh, it's a poem in the voice of a character. Uh, this is titled Catechism 101. And is, imagine, if you will, a little boy of uh, four years old asking the father questions. And I wrote this because my son used to ask me questions like that. Dada, if you don't shave for 600 days, will you look like Jesus? <laughs> if Jesus can do everything, can he count to infinity and 300 million and 23? When Jesus walked on water, was it like those guys we saw at Surface Paradise? Are there a lot of people called Jesus? How come he doesn't look the same in all the pictures? Was Jesus naughty and that's why he had time out on the cross? Thank you. So you can see that my son is a little bit of a smart aleck. Uh, and so am I. So it's hereditary. <laughs> Uh, in fact, my son will be joining SMU year after next. It's now the army. Now, speaking of my son, I've written a couple of, uh, of poems for him. And this one was the most uh, gut-wrenching piece for me to write. If ever anyone asked me what was the most difficult poem you ever had to write, it would be this one. I wrote this because I left the family. I had no way of telling him that I left the family for a reason. And it was very painful to write this. I remember I was writing this in the middle of a kopi camp. And I was actually crying. It was just tears coming up. And well, this is one of the few times I read this in public. Daddy's not home. Son, when a father leaves, what he left behind, he remembers, still loves. Like the familiar spot by the afternoon's, afternoon window or night bed, where he read, you on his lap, frequent times and far away, a pair of runaways, riding rough shot, work back, daring to bring home, laughing songs, sudden sleep. 
It's not right. No. Nothing is right. To go. Come what may. By choice or lack of commitment. How his guilt takes a beating. Fits into his own old wounds. Any way to absorb him of absence, cowardice, words heavy with duty and yields any day of the week. Son, forgive him. No just cause, but only just because walking out is not walking away. He may never know the point of no return. It's the point of no returns. Thank you. So uh, I will just uh, end off with a couple of uh, what I call dramatic monologues. These are poems in the voices of characters, uh, different kinds of characters. They're not uh, speaking from my perspective. I'm just inhibiting their skin and writing from their point of view. So the first one is in the voice of an abused wife. I did quite a bit of research about this. And the most gratifying thing was I once read this poem at a festival. And this lady came up to me and she said, I'm really um, connected with your poem because I, I, I was an abused wife. So this is a poem called I'll Walk. I make this knife talk. So imagine, if you will, this wife who has been battered to the point she picks up a knife and she threatens her husband. Come any nearer and I'll make this knife talk. Sweat in your guts. Cut you up and make you dinner for the dogs which is what you are and where you belong. You dare say you love me? Knuckles again at the ready. Do you know my small hours, the small steps I take to inch your damage off? Rosary holding down the tremor in my palms and watching some children and a lengthening laughing shadows lashing at my heart. No, I'm no longer your wife. This is my voice now. I will not put it down. I will not be put down. Thank you. And the second to last poem is another dramatic one not in the voice of a character. Uh, this was a bit unnerving because I woke up in the middle of the night with a woman's voice talking to me. And she was telling me how she was going to commit suicide. It's a bit strange. I, I, I'm not insane. Uh, although I may occasionally need the one or two session at IMH. OK, here it goes. This is called Notes for Suicide. I have a threat, long which I know I can unstitch any time I wish. Hands free. Thumbs crossed, fingers restless as we I become a crow roosting in my dreams. Thank you. Okay, finally, one last poem. Uh, I guess I'm getting a little bit happier. Huh? <laughs> this is titled, um, well, if you are keen to ask or find out why I have a tattoo of a typewriter. I'm not sure whether you can see it. It's not a birthmark. It's a, a typewriter, and I imprinted this about long about 2008. Uh, it's to give me the constant inspiration to write. I, I grew up writing one of these on one of these typewriters, old-fashioned typewriters. And I was at the point of giving up writing when I decided I was born to write. So I needed a painful and physical reminder to keep fighting. So this poem is written as a prayer against God. It's called Chronicle of a Tattoo of a Typewriter. Oh, by the way, this cost 300 bucks. And it took me three hours to get it done. Father, I have branded myself as yours on a Sunday, a day of rest. The ink, welding too long capillaries, has poured off the membrane, memories, found its own pen, finally. A striking expression of skin 
stigma, spam, letters, keys that deliver and open your letters, every stroke like a keyhole to your face, a typeface I can apprehend, where my fingertips move to seize it hostage, as do these lines, image imperfect. I am, as you have always meant me to be. Thank you very much for your time.